This grizzly bear is waiting. Waiting for the treasure the incoming tide will bring. Millions of salmon of several different species are now returning to these Alaskan coasts to reproduce in the same rivers in which they were born. If they get them. They are the largest brown bears in the world for a simple reason. They obtain extra rations of energy thanks to the annual presence of the salmon. The cat sets in motion a basic process in the life of all survivors on planet Earth. The process of obtaining the energy necessary for a living body to function. The energy brought by the salmon from the sea will not be used for the purpose it had intended. The meat no longer belongs to the fish. It has become part of the bear. The energy used by the bears to walk here every year is more than compensated for by the energy obtained, so much so that individuals literally cannot assimilate such enormous quantities of food. But killing does not always bring such rich rewards. Man, like the animal he is, also forms part of the energy cycle. Man learned how to use the energy of fire, and around the fire his prehensile hands developed a privileged brain capable of inventing the claws of the bear he did not have. But speech was the real motor of change. Through language, inventions were passed on from generation to generation, making it possible for humans to colonize the earth as they were able to obtain energy from other living beings, wherever they were. Just as these Australian Aborigines still do in the 21st century, human beings replaced biological evolution with cultural evolution transforming the accumulation of traditions into the most successful of all adaptive mechanisms. The final aim of all this is precisely the same need that spurs the bears on to catch the salmon, to obtain energy in an efficient manner. The hunter, having first removed the poisonous sting, proceeds to kill the ray. And killing is inevitable in the transfer of energy from one being to another. But the success of mankind as a thinking predator began in relatively recent times. Long before us, other animals honed their hunting techniques, aided by natural selection, a slow but surprisingly efficient process. On the Galapagos Islands lives a bird that is a good example of natural selection, in this case to catch fish, the brown pelican. Here, the Pacific Ocean brings fish to this young volcanic coast over 600 miles from the American continent. Mm -hmm. 
The method would appear to be simple. But it's a method not all predators can use. First, you have to know how to fly. A bird like this, also equipped with its very own fishing net, can permit itself the luxury of choosing a particular fish. Since the reptiles moved over the earth, birds have without a doubt achieved the most spectacular anatomical adaptations when it comes to fishing, not only here in Galapagos, but throughout the planet. Here on the plains of Venezuela, for example, over 20 species of birds fish in the same place, and they are all visibly different. It would seem impossible for any fish to survive such a constant onslaught, but they do, and there is food enough for everyone. The secret consists of using different methods. Some gather together and beat the water with their open beaks using their sense of touch. Others work alone. They remain very still, waiting for a fish to move and then harpoon it, if they're lucky. The final result is always the same, though there are some that use surprising techniques. The sissabill cuts the surface of the water with its lower jaw, which, unlike most birds, is longer. It has to avoid the obstacles and the alligators, but the system works. On the other side of the world, in the Celebes Islands, we find a good example of the inventiveness of man in compensating for his lack of wings and beak. Bear the Bajau. They are fishing with kites, an ancient method to which recently has been added the advantage of outboard motorboats, but essentially has remained unchanged for hundreds of years. The kite rises and the direction of the fishing line changes, warning the fisher of the precise moment when he must haul it in as fast as possible. Now, with a last effort, a large needlefish comes out of the water for the last time. But there are other human populations who, though they live far from the sea, also eat fish. Here on the Guiana Massif in the south of Venezuela live ancient ethnic groups who have inhabited the Amazon forest for over 3,000 years. The Sanama, the Yequanas, or the Maquiritare know that this particular liana contains a very special substance. They call them barbasco and after cutting them they carefully crush them to extract the sap. The curious thing about this technique is that over a thousand kilometers away, the Huaranis in Ecuador use it in exactly the same way. They are two completely different ethnic groups, but they have in common a profound knowledge of the jungle in which they live. Here, their diet lacks mineral salts, and so these two people, essentially hunters, are very glad of the occasional chance to eat fish. The barbasco simply absorbs the oxygen in the water, forcing the fish to come to the surface. 
They are small pools left behind by the river, and normally there are not many fish, and those there are very small. But they are grateful for this occasional and very valuable variation in their normal diet, even if it provides relatively little energy. When it comes to quantity, however, it would be difficult to beat another very distant culture. In the Mekong Delta in Vietnam, this family is heading home to their house built on the river itself. They do not have to go fishing, they literally live with the fish. Their houses are fish farms in which the carpet in the living room is in fact a trapdoor giving access to energy. The entire family participates in looking after and feeding the fish imprisoned beneath their home. Human beings have become so efficient that they have managed to move, whether wisely or not, from subsistence ecology to the market economy. The excess energy can then be exchanged for other goods or for money. In any case, the ultimate aim of all processes has not changed in the slightest. It is a question of eating the body of another animal in such a way that the effort is worth it, that the final energy balance is positive. Fishing implies in some way managing to get the fish out of the water, but when the struggle takes place on land, the problem is very different. Out here, the hunter and the prey share the same surroundings, breathe the same air. Here, the interchange of energy is face to face, a challenge which natural selection has resolved by creating real killing machines. some of the most famous assassins of all. This is a three-dimensional ecosystem. The thin outer branches are reasonably safe, but there is sun and wind, and the food is down below. Down there, where the shadows have eyes, where sight is unimportant and everyone is in fact listening. On each branch awaits a feast, or death. Everyone wants energy their bodies can use. Predation means catching with violence, the only language that evolution has taught the felines like this one. Of all the eyes on its body, only two can see. Remaining absolutely silent, it waits for something to make a mistake, a slight, subtle rustle which will betray the presence of potential prey. The Sigwana chose the wrong moment to wake from its sleep. The eyes of fear have found him, but he still hopes to remain unnoticed, camouflaged against the ground. Too close. This hunter is an ocelot, but it could be any of the dozens of species of highly specialized predators that live on Earth. Their numbers are insignificant compared to those of their prey, but nonetheless their role in evolution is vital because it is they who decide who will live and who will die. We 
We humans still have one foot in our biological past and the other in our cultural present. As man evolved as a hunter, he gained free hands to create tools. This led to an increasingly large brain, finally making possible the appearance of language. Then, like these huranias in the jungles of Ecuador, we were capable not only of inventing darts and blowpipes, but also of coating them with poisons obtained from nature. Thanks to speech, hunters could tell each other where the prey was, could describe the landscapes, and what is more important, they could discuss the many different hunting possibilities. Our hands developed in order to grab onto the branches, and our stereoscopic vision arose from the need to measure the distance between one trunk and another. But for some reason, we decided to come down to the ground. And when we adopted an erect stance, our hands could be used to manipulate objects. It was then that we became cultural animals. And that happened here, in Africa. These are Bushmen. They have been here in the Kalahari Desert for at least 6,000 years. In the same way as the Hurani Indians, they are preparing the poison with which they will smear their arrows. The same purpose, but using different ingredients. The fluids of the larva of a beetle, saliva, camungarunga seed, and sansavieria root. A mixture capable of felling anew with even a superficial graze. Throughout the world, Homo sapiens found a way to kill more and better, which made him the perfect predator. Now the animals he once shared the trees with have become his prey, his source of energy. Man hunts in large groups in a coordinated manner with a vast knowledge of the behavior of other animals. The young Waurani learns from his elders, observes and trains, sharing their experience. Not even the ocelot could catch a monkey high up in the trees, but the Huarani's blowpipes can launch the poison up into the very highest branches. And what is more, they are silent. So if one hunter fails, the master, the cultural predator, can still shoot. In just a few minutes, the poison takes effect in the monkey's body, and man once more climbs up into the branches, but this time to claim the reward for so many thousands of years of evolution. Cooperative hunting brought with it other consequences. The impulse to kill became dissociated from the impulse to eat when the food had to be transported to a home base. Then groups of males took over the task of getting meat for the family unit. Sharing the journey, risks and strategies, forged loyalty among them. The Huauranes still believe that when they return home, the prey belong to their wives. On the other side of the world, in Namibia, the Bushmen are also starting a day of hunting, but in very different surroundings. On the great African savanna, distances are enormous, smell is virtually useless, and the hunter must rely on sight alone. Sight, and of course, experience and knowledge of the terrain. The signs left behind by the passing herd speak to the bushman. Every blade of grass provides information. Every stone conveys a message.
Four hunters represent four families, and they need large prey in order to ensure the energy balance is positive. There they are, but getting close to a herd of oryx is not easy. Fortunately, they need get only close enough to reach them with their arrows. Again, the silence of the arrows is a major advantage. Though the first bowmen miss, the animals do not flee. There is merely a slight commotion. It's simply a matter of waiting until they calm down, then trying again. Now the herd is too nervous. It is time to release the last round of arrows and hope one of them will bring down an oryx. A wounded animal leaves unmistakable tracks while the powerful poison goes to work, killing it. The long-awaited moment has arrived. For at least 100,000 years, this scene has been repeated countless times in Africa. As quickly as possible, they have to cut up the oryx to be able to carry the greatest quantity of meat back to the village before the flies and the hyenas claim their share. The great predator, the triumph of the brain over the claw and the hoof. Fresh meat, energy to enable the body to function. The essence of life and of death. But Man the Hunter went further still. He needed to find meaning beyond his stomach and advanced further than any other animal had ever gone. With the blood of his prey, the ancient human clans began to think of the possible existence of superior forces. And the religious predator was born, the quintessence of human curiosity. In the frozen mountains of Kazakhstan and Mongolia, there still lives a people for whom hunting is much more than simply getting food to eat. According to ancient legend, it was Genghis Khan himself who first held out his left fist to a bird of prey, thus beginning this people's tradition of training eagles. The fact is, the Kazakhs have achieved perfect symbiosis with both the horse and the golden eagle. These enormous golden eagles are all females, which are larger. They were caught in the mountain called Kantengri by young men using nets and trained with dedication to hunt wolves and foxes. For ten years, the two hunters will live together. An old proverb says, the eagle has his wings, the Kazakh his horse. A fox. Immediately, what for man is merely a dot on the horizon alerts the visual brain of the eagles when their hoods are removed. When they spot something moving, they instinctively launch into attack. Their sight is eight times more acute than that of humans. One after another, the berkute, as they call them, with their seven kilos in weight, swoop down, reaching speeds of up to 200 kilometers an hour against a formidable enemy that could easily kill them. And the trainer flies off after his eagle. After 10 years together, the Kazakh will release his eagle, which will live for another 20 years in freedom in the mountains of Mongolia. Until then, the two predators will kill together with no reward other than the greatest of all energies, friendship. <laughs> <laughs> 